Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning on our second Sunday after Epiphany. As Jesus was we celebrated Jesus' baptism last week, this week we begin the call. Jesus calls his disciples this week in Nathaniel. We hear about the call of Samuel and God's call to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul. Welcome to worship. We're glad you could be here. The screen should guide you through things, and please know when it comes time for Holy Communion, all baptized Christians are welcome to the Lord's table. I'll invite you to stand. We'll begin by singing, Lord, I lift your name on you.
Thanks be to you, Lord Jesus Christ, most merciful Redeemer, for the countless blessings and benefits you give. May we know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day, praise you, with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the Lord.
Good morning. So I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you a story about Sam. Do you know any Sams from school? I have Sam. You know Sam? My friend. So this is a story about Sam who, who is helping out the pastor. Um, and one day he sleeps over at, at he has a room in the pastor's church, really. And one day he wakes up in the middle of the night, Sam wakes up in the middle of the night, and he hears a voice. Sam, Sam. And he runs in to talk to the pastor and says, Hey, were you calling me? And the pastor says, No, go back to bed. You ever do that? You ever run into mom and dad's room and say, Hey, wake up, I heard something. You ever do that? Um, usually, I usually hear stuff, but it usually sounds scary. It usually sounds scary. So then. That's why I just cover myself with covers to look like a ghost. Oh! My well, then Sam was really, really brave, wasn't he, to get out of bed and go see what was going on. So, second time that happens, he hears this voice and he runs in and asks the pastor, and he says, No, no, it wasn't me. Go back to bed. Third time, he hears the voice. He runs into the pastor and says, You know what? That was God talking to you. So the next time, when Sam hears the voice, he knows that it's God speaking to him. The lesson in the story is that sometimes young people, children, need parents to help them hear God's word. Well, I actually heard it. You did? Okay. But Sam, see, Sam didn't know it at first, right? It was God talking to him. He didn't even know it at first. But we need parents. Sometimes we need parents for all kinds of things, right? Um, any of you drive yet? Nope. No, 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 not go driving yet. Well, I, I drive a remote control tractor. <laughs> okay. It's mostly a remote control. Remote control. There's, little, there's these little, like, moon instructions. That, that's very safe, isn't it? For you, anyway. Not for those who run over their toes. So, uh, we need parents. But guess what? We also need one another. Even grown-ups need God. So, we need one another to remind us to listen for God's voice. So that was the story about Samuel. He's called Samuel in the Bible. And Eli is the priest. Samuel's helping Eli. Eli teaches Samuel to listen for God's voice. Just as your mom and dad and Sunday school teachers and pastors and friends encourage you to listen for God's voice. You know, so. I have like a wind-up card. So I have three wind-up cards and wind-up for so And my grandparents gave it to me and that's one of the ones, of course, that's great. That's great. You got, you got all kinds of toys in there, huh? Are they quiet toys? Pretty quiet, right? All right. I'm not going to, I'm going to, I'm making a new bucket. So no bucket for this week. I'll bring the bucket next week, and I'll hand it out to somebody. Um, so that's all I got. All right. Thanks for listening to my story about Sam. Story is about us. All right, back to your seats. Back to your seats. You, I guess you can stay there. You can, you can stay there. It's all right. Grandpa, I don't want to go anywhere. So at a time when visions are rare and unexpected, the Lord comes to Samuel and calls him to speak the divine word. Though just a boy, Samuel responds to God obediently as Eli the priest has taught him to respond. This marks the beginning of Samuel's prophetic ministry. In our second reading this morning, Paul is helping the Corinthians understand that God has claimed the entirety of their lives through the death of Christ. Hence, Christian relationships and conduct, including areas of human sexuality, are to reflect the reality that we belong to Christ and that the Holy Spirit lives within us. So we hear now the word. I'm going to tell you a longer reading about Sam. Our first reading is from 1 Samuel. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. 
the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli, and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of every, anyone who hears it tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God and did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning, and then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, he said, here I am. Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And then he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Be Let's read Psalm 139 responsibly. Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips, but you, O Lord, know it all together. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain on it. I will thank you because I am marvelously made. Your works are wonderful, and I know it well. Your eyes beheld my limbs yet unfinished in the womb. All of them were written in your book. They were fashioned day by day, when as yet there were none of them. If I were to count them, they would be more in number than the sand. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is meant not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord 
and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to, pro to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, the two shall be one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body, but the fornicator sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were brought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. The word of the Lord. gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will, see heaven, the heaven, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Here we are in John's Gospel. In the very first chapter, um, what has happened is John has had his prelude. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then John the Baptist appears in, on the scene, uh, baptizing along the River Jordan. And just before this, John the Baptist has identified Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God. And Andrew and John, the apostle, have followed after Jesus. So now it's the next day, and Jesus has decided to go to Galilee. And he calls out to Philip, and the story, there's not much there in the story, right? He found Philip and said to him, follow me. And Philip just left whatever he was doing and followed Jesus. But the story we have here is more about Nathaniel. And Nathaniel, like Thomas at the end of John's Gospel, gets words that, that highlight the direction of the entire rest of the book. For Nathaniel is easily impressed, I think. He declares, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. It is not until doubting Thomas sees the risen Lord that we get such a clear declaration, my Lord and my God. But as I said, Nathaniel seems to be easily impressed. Philip says, we found the one that the Bible has been predicting. We found the one who is the Messiah. Moses wrote about him in the law. The prophets have written about him. Come and see. Well, this fellow's from Nazareth? Nothing good comes out of Nazareth. So I don't know what little village around Janesville to pick on, but bear with me. 
nothing good comes out of Broadhead. I don't know why. It's that sort of thing, right? How could anything good come out of Nazareth? It can't really be that the Messiah, the Savior, the King would come from Nazareth. As Nathanael is following Philip to meet this Jesus, Jesus declares, here is truly an Israelite, in him there is no deceit, in whom there is no guile, I think the King James Version says. He's honest with his words. Nazareth? And Nathaniel asks, well, how did you get to know me? I've not met you before. How did you get to know who I am? Jesus said, I saw you under the fig tree before, Nathan before Philip called you. And then Nathaniel replies with this declaration, you are the son of God, you are the king of Israel. It seems out of proportion. Easily impressed. But Jesus reminds Nathaniel, as he reminds us, that being impressed is not the point. Because we too oftentimes find ourselves easily impressed. I, I have teenage daughters at my house. They hate it when I talk about them, but nonetheless, they, they like trivia. And they like uh, Guinness Book of World Record people. And they are easily impressed. But aren't we too that celebrity gets our attention and gets to the front of our newspapers and gets, gets all kinds of attention. And because of how we are impressed, we, we change how we live our lives. Things that impress us, we, we gravitate to. We adjust what we buy, what we purchase, how we live, how we act, by what impresses us. But in this gospel reading, Jesus reminds us that it isn't about what is impressive. Not for Nathaniel, and not for you and I. The essential things of life are not what is most impressive, what is glossiest and brightest and sold the hardest to us. The Apostle Paul faced the same challenge of what is impressive. Let me back up, make a, a pastoral, a personal pastoral confession that I'm sometimes envious of those who are impressive professionally. You know, we got the Joyce Myers, we got the Joel Olsteins, we got those kind of folks with mega churches and TV shows and and private airplanes and millions of dollars. And it's about at that, that point that I remind myself what's impressive is not what's most important. The Apostle Paul faces the same challenge. In this week's daily readings, if you were reading along, we had a passage from 2 Corinthians where Paul's writing to that Corinthian church that he's got such a strange relationship with. And he, and he quotes this line. His letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible, as if someone had said this about him. And Paul continues writing in his own letter, let such people understand that what we say by letter when absent, we will also do when present. Paul's being criticized because he's not flashy enough. He's not a big deal. He's not aggrandizing himself, even though as we read his letters often, it seems like he is aggrandizing himself. But he's pointing, rather, to the cross of Christ. As we are meant to put our eyes upon the cross of Christ, and not all the things that dazzle, and all the things that impress, and all the things that lead us astray. And that's the point that Paul makes in 1 Corinthians, where he talks about the cross in contrast to the wisdom of the world and the power of the world. Ooh, aren't those the things that impress us? The powerful. Well, or the entertaining. And the wise or the smart or the one that has the next gadget to sell us. Paul says, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent words, 
so that the cross of Christ might be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discerning of the dis discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of the world, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. You know that passage. You've heard it before. But what is Paul saying? Don't be led astray by what seems impressive, what seems bright and shiny and new, what seems popular. Look to the cross of Jesus Christ. I got no book deals. I got no private jets. I got no millions. But I get to declare to you a message of salvation, a message of life, a message of the kingdom of God and of God's love for the world through Jesus Christ. I get to proclaim to you the gospel. That is what is significant to me. And to invite you to see as well not the shiny, bright, distracting things, but the cross of Christ for your own salvation. For the thing that Jesus promises Nathaniel is also not shiny and bright. You will see greater things, Nathaniel, than my revelation that I knew you under the fig tree you will see the God of the universe giving his life on a cross for the salvation of the world, for your salvation. Amen.
God has made us God's people through our baptism into Christ. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident that God, our light, and our salvation hears us when we pray, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For the church throughout the world, and for all called to its various ministries, let the Holy Spirit invite us and others to come and see. And we pray in thanksgiving for the anniversary this week of the baptism of Mark Janes, Daniel Johnson, Lori Madison, Tammy Brother Ridge, Heather Doss, Krista and Innocenti, Stacy Cutts, Lori Craig, and Levon Struli. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For the well-being of creation, for plants that provide nourishment for animals that tend their young, that your goodness will be revealed through all creation, let us pray. Have mercy, O God for the nations and all in authority, for advocates, for those who work for racial justice and for our community, that all people may thrive together in harmony and order. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For all who are oppressed, for those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, we pray especially for Vi, Melvin, Fern, Mavis, Elaine, Kelly, Barbara, Carol, Greg, Jim, Lois, Nancy, Wanda, Gary, Larry, Helena, Tim, Annette, Sandy, Jacob, Alan, Todd, Wanda, Bev, Sandy, Judy, Bob, Patricia, Elsie, Carlene, Betty, Connie, and those we name, name now silently or aloud. For caregivers and families, for those who grieve and cannot sleep, that comfort will come to those in any distress. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God, for travelers, for those unable to attend worship today, for members of our community celebrating special events, and for those who request prayers. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God, in thanksgiving for those who followed Christ and now rest from their labors, especially Martin Luther King Jr. commemorated this week that their witness provide a model of prophetic leadership and tireless justice making. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. Merciful God, you hear our prayers even before we speak them. Receive them for the sake of the one through whom you have revealed your goodness, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Let us share Christ's peace with our brothers and sisters. Peace be with
as we make our ways back to our seats, the usual reminders, please fill in the welcome pad that's near the center aisle. That's our record of attendance and communion in this new year, so please fill that in. All baptized Christians are welcome at the Lord's table. Please come commune with us. We will receive our offering as we sing our song and prepare for communion. Please stand as you're able and let us pray. Father, we acknowledge that you own and love this whole creation. Nevertheless, receive what we offer here as if it were our own, that we may add substance to our Eucharist for life and health and light and glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy God, mighty Lord, gracious Father, endless is your mercy and eternal your reign. You have filled all creation with light and life. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. 
We praise you for the grace shown to your people in every age, the promise to Israel, the rescue from Egypt, the gift of the promised land, the words of the prophets, and at this end of all the ages, the gift of your Son, who proclaimed the good news in word and deed, and was obedient to your will, even to giving his life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Therefore, O God, with this bread and cup, we remember the life our Lord offered for us. And believing the witness of his resurrection, we await his coming in power to share with us the great and promised feast. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. So now we pray, your Holy Spirit, that we who share in Christ's body and blood may live to the praise of your glory and receive our inheritance with all your saints in light. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Join our prayers with those of your servants of every time and every place and unite them with the ceaseless petitions of our great high priest until he comes as victorious Lord of all. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. That, gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Come, be filled with light and life. Thanks be to God. Please be seated.
stand as you're able and let us pray. Lord Jesus, we rejoice in this memorial of the life you have given for us, your friends. We praise you for your love and long to follow in your paths, that we may come to see you in your glory. You are Lord with the Father and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. <coughs> Please be seated for a couple of things. He has made me glad.
peace be the light of Christ. Thanks be to God.